Hi everyone, I'm David Fisher, and this is Presidential Chronicles. The series of books and videos on American history is seen through the lives of the presidents of the United States. This episode is from the life of Gover Cleveland, and the focus is fighting the good fight to the end. The year is 1894, it's Cleveland's second term, the economy is front and center on his agenda, and that included labor relations. Look, income inequality had continued to get bigger and bigger during this era, and Cleveland was very aware of this. In fact, in his first term, he became the first president to really take the side of labor on one issue, particularly after the Haymarket Square bombing brought a lot of attention to this. He had pushed for some arbitration methods to come into play. In the second term, though, things would be a little different, and this time it's centered on a particular strike at the Pullman Palace Car Company. George Pullman had established a very successful company building these Pullman cars, these sleeping cars, which were made specifically to allow people to sleep comfortably while they're on the railroad. Very popular. Well, Pullman made a lot of money. He built a company town that was also a high-end company town, and his workers liked living there, even though the rents were pretty high because of all the services that they offered. The problem was when the economy went sour in Cleveland's second term, all of a sudden the job security of those workers was at risk and their salaries were cut. The rents were not cut by Pullman, but the salaries were, and when they appealed to him, he said, no, I'm not cutting my rents, and so the workers went on strike. In this case, the American Railway Union and its leader, Eugene Debs, decided to recognize that strike and nationalize it. Any train that had a Pullman car was subject to the strikers, and all of a sudden, across 27 states, tra a transit on the trains basically came to a screeching halt. Well, Richard Olney was now the Attorney General of the United States. He had been, up until recently, an attorney for the railroad. So not surprisingly, he wanted to go in and crush this strike and use troops to do it if he needed to. But he also realized that Cleveland wasn't going to go for that without a better case. So he put together basically a three-part plan. Number one, get the federal courts to issue an injunction against the strikers. Number two, have a marshal try to enforce that injunction, and if, as expected, that didn't go well, then he would get to number three, and he would send in the troops, or at least get the president to, if he could convince him. Well, it was not hard to get that federal injunction because the courts had almost always sided with management in the past, and besides, in this case, there were two federal issues at stake the interstate commerce and the delivery of the U.S. mails, both of which the federal government had responsibilities and accountability for, and in this case, these were threatened by the strike. That was the purpose for the injunction that they got on July 1st of 1894. The next day, the marshal by the name of J.W. Arnold tried to enforce that injunction in the small town of Blue Island, Illinois, just outside of Chicago. Well, not surprisingly, the workers erupted, said, no, we're not going to stand down. They turned over rail cars left and right. They attacked the marshal and his deputies, who did exactly what Olney was hoping for. He cabled back to Washington that I am unable to disperse the mob, clear the tracks, or arrest the men who were engaged in the act's name. It is my judgment that the troops should be here at the earliest moment. An emergency has arisen for their presence in this city. Well, Olney had what he needed to go to the president, who authorized sending in troops to quell the violence and effectively would impact the strike. He did this despite the fact that his fellow Democrat, John Altgeld, who was the governor of Illinois at the time, said, no, I don't want your troops. I've got this under control, and if I need you, I'll call for help. Well, Cleveland said, no, you don't have it under control. I'm the president. There's federal issues here. I'm going to send in those troops. And in fact, he said that if it takes the entire Army and Navy of the United States to deliver a postal card in Chicago, that card will be delivered. The troops showed up, and initially this led to more violence, more burning of rail cars, tipping them over. Troops then fired into the crowds. There was injury. There was death. This was a, obviously a very difficult and contentious situation. What really crushed the strike, though, was when the Justice Department took its next move and arrested Debs and 71 union leaders. All of a sudden, with the leadership gone, the strike eventually petered out, and by July 20th, the whole thing was over. But Debs, as far as he was concerned, wasn't willing to let this sit. He felt that both the initial injunction and the arrests were frankly unconstitutional, they were illegal, and he sued the government over them. It went all the way to the Supreme Court, and the court issued a unanimous opinion against the union in favor of the actions of the government, frankly a complete vindication of the policies and the methods used by the Cleveland administration. It came down to those two key issues interstate commerce, and the delivery of the U.S. mail. 
mail. As far as the courts were concerned, the federal government had a right to protect those, these important areas. And if that meant sending in troops to shut down a strike that was, was impacting these, they had a right to do that. It was vindication for Cleveland and his administration. It was also a warning sign for the unions in terms of their leverage and techniques for going forward. Foreign affairs. We had already talked in our last episode about what Cleveland had done about the rebellion in Hawaii, but now in the Americas, he had another issue to deal with. And now Cleveland initially had, had kind of taken a neutral position in foreign policy, kind of hearkening back to the days of George Washington, where he thought the best policy for the United States was to remain neutral. But in South America right now, there was something where he decided to engage, and it was a conflict between Venezuela and the British, particularly over a plot of land called British Guyana. And this, this conflict was becoming contentious. There were threats going back and forth across the Atlantic. Initially, Cleveland decided to stay out, but the more contentious this got, he decided to move in. And he had his new Secretary of State take the lead. His friend Walter Gresham, as Secretary of State, had recently died. And so what did he do? He switched Richard Olney, who had just been so aggressive and successful in the Pullman strike, into the job as Secretary of State. And Olney wrote a compelling, powerful letter to the British, frankly, warning them about their actions dating back to the Monroe Doctrine, which had been issued, of course, decades before by the nation's fifth president, warning the Europeans to stay out of any future colonization in the Americas, including both North and South America. And this principle was at stake as far as Cleveland was concerned, and he liked the aggressive stance of only. After he showed him the letter, Cleveland said, it's the best thing of the kind I ever read, and it leads to a conclusion that one cannot escape if he tries. That is, if there is anything in the Monroe Doctrine at all. You show there is a great deal of that and place it, I think, on better and more defensible ground than any of your predecessors or mine. They sent the letter to the British, but then they had to wait. There was a change in government going on in the British, and they were hoping for us a new change in attitude about this situation. They waited six months before they got a reply, and the Americans were disappointed because the British basically said the Monroe Doctrine has nothing to do with this. The United States basically stay out of our business. Well, Grover Cleveland now saw this as an issue of principle. And as we've seen over his episodes and over his career, when he sees this issue of right and wrong, he was ready to pick a side. And what he believed was right, he was going to go all in. And that was the case here. Cleveland sent a special letter to Congress, making it very clear where he stood when he said, it will, in my opinion, be the duty of the United States to resist by every means in its power as a will for aggression upon its rights and interests, the appropriation by Great Britain of any lands or the exercise of governmental jurisdiction over any territory, which after investigation we have determined of right belongs to Venezuela. By every means in its power, that meant war, and everybody knew it. Cleveland was willing to take up arms, in this case to defend the Venezuelans and all of the Americas, if the British persisted. Well, first of all, Cleveland doesn't bluff, and I think people knew this. But more importantly, the British didn't want war. This wasn't worth it to them. They had relatively quickly agreed to arbitration to settle the matter, and the matter sort of went away. It actually had a couple of implications. The relationship between the U.S. and the British wasn't harmed by this. In fact, it was helped. It brought them closer together, which was a very positive thing, and sure strengthened the Monroe Doctrine, as, as Cleveland put the force of arms behind it by the United States. Didn't have to move in that direction, but the threat itself enforced the concepts in the Monroe Doctrine. The bulk of Cleveland's second term, though, was based on the economy and the national panic that had kicked in. He had stopped those silver purchases from draining gold out of the U.S. Treasury when he got, in his first year, the Bland Allison and Sherman Silver Purchase Acts repealed. But the fact is the gold reserves were increasingly low, down to $70 million in the U.S. Treasury votes, well below the legal limit. Why was this? Because, well, there's still a lot of silver out there, and people could still legally bring their silver to the government and ask for it to be redeemed in gold. Plus, there was a concern about the United States and gold, so foreign uh, partners, business partners, started paying their tariffs in silver, and again, so gold was not coming into the treasury. 
what was Cleveland going to do? Because the silver rights in Congress still wanted to push for silver. They were not going to give him any relief from a source of legislation to try to do something to right this ship and preserve the gold standard and the gold sense of currency for the United States. So what did Cleveland do? He really felt he had only one option, and it was a law from 25 years before. 1870 was a law that permitted the executive branch to sell bonds under certain conditions. Well, he agreed to do this. His first offering, $50 million, 10-year notes at 5%, and he quickly realized that, frankly, it wasn't enough. These were paid in gold by the, by the people who were buying these bonds, but $50 million wasn't enough to stall, stop the problem. As things continued to grow, he put out another bid, another $50 million bond sale. Initially, he thought it was stable, but it wasn't. By 1895, the gold reserves were now down to $41 million, and Cleveland was desperate. Frankly, sudden claims on the, on the Treasury at this point could cause the United States to default. He could, of course, always pay in silver, but that was completely odious to him. He would never do that because it would show the United States is off the gold standard and those inflationary silver dollars were actually going to be paying at less than par value. The credit worthiness of the United States would sink. He wasn't going there. Congress continued to not offer any help. He could only sell these bonds again, but this time he was desperate for time, and so he decided to do a private offering. For that, the White House called upon financier J.P. Morgan, who came to the White House, came to the White House February 7th of 1896 and drove a pretty hard bargain. He and his syndicate agreed to purchase $65 million in bonds, pay in gold. And there were a couple of keys to this, though, that because they were on pretty favorable terms for Morgan that Cleveland did get. The first of all was that half the gold had to come from Morgan's partners in Europe. He wanted an influx of gold from outside the United States. And he needed the syndicate to agree to the following, that they would exert all influence and make all legitimate efforts to protect the treasury of the United States against the withdrawals of gold pending the complete performance of the contract. That was critical to Cleveland. Now, Cleveland was criticized over this in large part because Morgan and his, his fellow financiers sold these bonds on the open market to a great profit almost immediately thereafter. So Cleveland was criticized about not getting a good deal. He felt it was the best deal he could, and he did get a couple of those assurances. The problem was it still wasn't enough. The Treasury was not stable yet, and Cleveland felt he had to do one more purchase. Maybe one more big one would actually create the final stability that he was looking for. So he agreed to go for one more, go big. This would be a public sale of $100 million to be paid in gold. Morgan wanted all of this because, again, he got a lot of profits out of the last deal, but this was a public offering. Morgan put in his bid. He got a big chunk of it, but there were other investors who outbid him, including small investors. You could buy some of this for as little as $50 a pop in terms of those bonds, and this time it finally worked. Over $250 million over the course of four pur purchases through these bond sales had finally brought a stable condition to the Treasury vaults and the U.S. would stay on the gold standard. There was no default. There was no going off to silver. But for Grover Cleveland, this was devastating politically. This was incredibly unpopular within the country. A lot of the country wanted silver. They set people in the South, the people in the West, the borrowers, the farmers, and a lot of them were in his party. The Democratic Party was increasingly turning away from the president, away from gold, and onto silver. Cleveland knew it. He said that I am sure I was never more completely in the right path of duty than I am now, but it is depressing enough to have no encouragement from any quarter. I believe I shall hold out, but doubt if I shall ever advise anyone to lose the support of party in the hope of finding support among those who beyond partisanship profess a patriotic desire for good government. He, of course, put himself in that latter category. He did stay the course. He did what he needed to do in terms of the gold standard and the treasury economy, but he lost his party and he became increasingly unpopular. It all came to a head at the Democratic Convention in 1896 to find a replacement for Cleveland. Now, Cleveland wasn't running again, but his policies were very much on the agenda at the Chicago Coliseum when the Democrats got together and they basically bashed Cleveland left and right. According to one reporter, never before in American history has a president sunk so low as Cleveland has fallen. Never has a president been so held in contempt by the people.
No one is interested enough to care what he does or says. Cleveland has been driven out of his party. This is the man who had been their standard bearer for not one, not two, but three consecutive presidential elections, and now he was tossed out. The, uh, the uh, delegates there were in, enraptured by the 36-year-old former congressman by the name of William Jennings Bryan, who was all in on silver. He was a sp spellbinding orator. He gave his famous cross of gold speech at this particular Demo Democratic convention. He was nominated, and Cleveland was disgusted with his party just as much as they were disgusted with him. He thought this was completely the wrong direction for the country. In fact, many of his supporters left the party. They established a new group called the Gold Democrats. Cleveland wouldn't join them. In fact, he wouldn't criticize the party. He wouldn't support it either. He decided to remain silent. But secretly, he was rooting for, his op for the opposition, the Republican William McKinley, which again is strange bedfellows because Cleveland had been at odds politically with McKinley just a few years before over the McKinley tariff, which frankly Cleveland decried. But that was secondary. Sound money principles, that's what was most important to Cleveland at this time. That's what McKinley stood for. And when McKinley beat uh, Bryan in the election, the Democrat Grover Cleveland was happy to see a Republican moving into the White House. When Cleveland was done, he was off to a three-week fishing trip trying to figure out what he was going to do next for the rest of his life for the 22nd and 24th President of the United States. That's the story for another day. That's Grover Cleveland and fighting the good fight to the end from the life of Grover Cleveland. For more Presidential Chronicles, check out my books on Amazon.com and don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel. Until next time, I'm David Fisher. This is Presidential Chronicles.